All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome all of our remote guests and in-person guests to our final and last uh, series of summer lectures. Um, today, I have the pleasure to introduce Katharina Richter-Lund and Joel Kerna. I am going to start to introduce Katharina Richter-Lund um, at 18. Years, Katharina moved to the United States to pursue a Bachelor of Architecture degree from the California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo. Her conviction to go to California stemmed from her mother, who became a naturalized US citizen in 1974 and pursued her career in San Diego. Inspired by her mother, who was both a physiologist and an art therapist, Katharina wanted to reach beyond the discipline of architecture, an ambition that led her to begin her interest in addressing mental health through design. After practicing professionally at several world-renowned architecture firms, including Geary Partners, where she worked for three years, Katharina returned to school to receive her master's in design technology from Harvard Graduate School of Design. Inspired by the work she had begun in her undergraduate studies and by her own struggles with stress and anxiety, Katharina researched how architecture could be enriched by psychology, technology, and neuroscience to address mental well being through the built environment. Katharina is now in the doctoral design program at Harvard, where she is currently continuing her research across the various schools and labs of Harvard and MIT. Her work today focuses on using technology, neurologi neurological and physiological metrics, and existing research in cognitive psychology to quantify the built environment's effect on mental health. Katharina seeks to envision how architecture design and our latest technological tools can embody spatial forms of therapy to provide more empathetic, seamless, and accessible design solutions to emotional disorders. Besides that, Katharina, for the second year, is an instructor and leading coordinator for the Teen Art Program, which is a very um, big task because our Teen Art Program is very large and she oversees around 100 uh, to 140 students in Teen Art and uh, coordinates between seven to 10 other instructors. And uh, we are very excited to have Katharina present her work here today. So with that, help me welcome Katharina. Okay. Hello everyone. So um, as mentioned by Yulia, I am a doctoral design student at the Harvard Graduate School of Design in Boston. I'm in going into my third year, which will hopefully be my last. And um, today I'm gonna present work and research that's very much more academic, um, stemming from my undergraduate work all the way until my dissertation work today, hopefully giving you a broad understanding and uh, seeing the extent to which architecture and design can really extend beyond the discipline. Uh, so for a little quick intro of where I am from, since it might be helpful, um, as mentioned in my introduction to, at uh, TNARC, I am French and my first language is French. However, I'm also from a multitude of European countries with my mother being from England, my father being from Germany and having received my IB program in high school in Athens, Greece. Then moving to Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo for my undergraduate degree in California and now being located on the East Coast in Boston for my master's and uh, PhD work. Uh, so I was trained as an architect and was got the pleasure to work in a number of offices, but more primarily Gary Partners, located here in Los Angeles. Um, had the chance to work on Facebook and also um, Arl in located in the south of France, quite close to my hometown. However, as you will quickly see, I've always had a broader ambition of the discipline, and I'm continuously expanding my expertise in areas such as psychophysiology, effective computing, technology, robotics, and domains within social sciences, all with the fundamental goal in investigating how we might be able to address, improve mental well being at the level of the individual, such as through wearables, as well as the collective 
through architecture and interior design. In order to illustrate my topic of research, I'll br briefly walk through a few works which embody these ideals um, and general categories. Starting with architecture and the environment. In my early undergraduate work, I became fascinated with the potential for psychological treatments to be paralleled with architecture design. For example, this was my undergraduate thesis project, which, which, look, which looking at, looked at researching methods commonly used in psychology, such as exposure therapy, systematic desensitization, and classical conditioning, and using such methodology to guide elements such as program, materiality, and spatial design. So focusing at first primarily on phobias related to our environment, such as claustrophobia and agoraphobia, I proceeded to lead individuals through a series of spaces, which would then prompt the, the fear to then immediately contrast that experience with soothing spatial environments. Then increase these exposures through a journey through, through a space rather than more conscious exposures we might be familiar with in therapeutic strategies addressing phobias. Okay, so this was of, often done uh, through um, contrasting the experience with soothing and spatial environments, then increase these exposures through the journey through a specific space rather than more conscious exposures. So thinking about architecture and space and spatial design as something we experience subconsciously and thus something that we can actually address phobias and fears in a subconscious manner. And this is a theme that kind of comes and goes throughout my work. These are just undergraduate projects that I think really show that I'm consistently looking at natural and organic forms uh, in the inspiration a lot of my designs throughout my undergraduate degrees, often looking at multi-material modeling and 3D printing. And uh, again, very inspiration from very organic shapes and forms. Being frustrated by often the speculative essence of many undergraduate design projects, I would often seek to translate these similar ideas into furniture. Uh, so where I would look at the fine line between comfort and discomfort. Fabricating furniture is often a great way for architects to explore ideas and qualities at a much quicker pace than the full-scale building and is a thing that I often um, worked on in my undergraduate degrees. So I added a few slides from Cal Poly here that's really focused on looking at um, building different, more um, experiential spaces, using fabrication as a tool um, and building physical prototypes. Cause I think it's really cool to see how hands-on architecture discipline is um, in school, in undergrad. This is a little bit of a promo for Cal Poly, of course. So it was, a, it was then, however, when I started my master's in design technology at Harvard, that I started to explore the world of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So these new tools opened up a whole new world for me around not only gathering and interpreting data, but also how to translate physiological symptom, symptoms. So those are things like heart rates, uh, um, skin temperature, perhaps a respiration rate, all of these things are perhaps less commonly identified um, that happen in, internally, um, and how to translate those through visualizations and music and create experiences that would foster greater, greater mental awareness and personalized experiences. So this first project looked at evaluating a person's EEG waves. So those are your brain, brain frequencies um, while listening to music and would adjust different aspects of the music. So the volume, the pace, um, as their EEG frequencies change. So a little bit diagrammatically, perhaps this, um, so as the sound plays, as you're listening to the music, the current brain wave activity from the listener is registered through this Muse headband and streaming directly to the system controlling the sound manipulation. This activity is then analyzed in real time to affect different characteristics of sound. So the volume, the speed or input quality and then allowing the users to have a certain amount of maybe mental agency over the music they are listening to, while also giving them feedback of their current um, mind state. There's a video that I won't play for the sake of time. 
And then more in, in a more serious line of, uh, of research, this work then um, translated to thinking about voice modulation through neurological feedback to intuitively adjust the prosody of your voice. So for example, right now I'm presenting to all of you and perhaps I'm a little bit nervous so I'm speaking at a faster pace or maybe my tone is going up and down. This software uh, in real time, if I was wearing a Muse headband would recognize those signals of stress and would change in real time the speed of my voice or the prosody so that I would come across a lot more confident and uh, you know, better. So that's just a, a project I worked on in a more um, applica applica application-based um, example. Okay, then I, I jumped into the world of social robotics. Um, so having worked in digital fabrication in the past in my undergraduate degree, I was familiar with a series of these tools, but had never envisioned them being used in dialogue really between humans and materials. So for example, in this robot Zen garden, or even using robots in artistic collaboration with dancers. So I got the great opportunity to collaborate with scientist and dancer, Dr. Merritt Moore at the Harvard Art Lab in her research into creating a human robot duet. So in this pro uh, project, the creative parallel between human and machine manifests itself physically as a collaboration with the performer. And in this, um, in this project, we were looking at how the robot itself could mirror or mimic uh, movements of the dancer in a way that took on a, their, its own personal characteristics. So um, in a second iteration, she was actually wearing biometric devices that again recorded moments of heart rate elevation or perhaps sweating throughout a performance. And those little in, um, instances of information got translated to the robot and would adjust the robot's perhaps speed, rotation, or, um, or direct mirroring so that it had a little bit more of a personal touch. Perhaps um, one would say give character uh, to the robot itself. Uh, you should check out her full video. It's really very impressive. And then wearable computing. So uh, for those of you who don't know what wearable computing is, these are different wearable, meaning you wear them on your body or they're close to your skin. They can be clothes, they can be um, earpieces, jewelry uh, that has some sort of computing power intelligence, technological intelligence embedded into them. So I had previously done work in the field of materials and in particular biomaterials. Uh, so I was eager to look at materials and their potential uh, chance to embed um, more influence and intelligence into them. So DOZE was a collaborative project between architects, engineers, and scientists. Um, this is more on the scientific side, but essentially while looking at the, to, looking to address the growing prevalence of poor sleep uh, and embrace material qualities of, in this case, hydrogels, we developed a sleep mask, which could be tuned to your sleep rhythms based on your personal biometrics. And essentially it activated a heater that was embedded into the mask and it released specific scents throughout the night, depending on the scent that you might need. So for example, lavender has been associated with soothing smells um, or soothing experiences while peppermint might be more associated with uh, an awaking uh, experience. So those smells were tuned throughout the night so that uh, different smells would be activated. This is again, another more scientifically based project, but very interesting in the sense that using acupoint, which is the, the pressure of different parts of your, on your body, acupressure and um, uh, different uh, little um, tense, uh, transcutational, uh, stimulation, you, you're actually able to trick your brain into uh, decreasing your urge to smoke. So addiction, it's an addiction based um, addressing wearable. Um, I think it's really, I wanted to show this project. It's very scientific, but I wanted to show it because again, it still comes down to aesthetic and it comes down to design and how you design a piece that can be worn by many to address actually a very serious concern. Okay, that was a, like a really quick overview of some, some things that I wanted to address. I'm gonna jump into my thesis and then that's pretty much gonna wrap up. Um, this is my master's thesis work. Uh, and I think it's 
really shows how you can bring all of these into one project. So this is perhaps the part of the presentation where I would like to address methods, since in my case, I'm not only dealing with methods of architecture and design, but also those of the social sciences, computing, and I and really want to emphasize the range of topics beyond just of design. So such as psychophysiology psychophysiology and embodied cognition, sensory environments and design, and effective computing and human-machine interaction. And it's sort of in this overlap where I would like to situate my work, both previous and forthcoming, and the methodology that I follow for all of my design interventions. So for example, in my thesis, in order to suggest a possible methodology that explores our sensory perception, I first looked at each sense in isolation and the range of cognitive in impact each of these senses hold on our mood and emotion. This led to de the design of four prosthetics, which investigated different combination of sensory experiences, which respond to a very specific psychological, uh, psychophysiological signal. I think it's important to understand again, diagrammatically how these work. So each of these pieces follow the same closed loop system, starting with the human, a collection of their raw physiological signals are collected, this is such as heart rate, uh, electrodom activity, um, skin temperature, respiration rates, muscle tension. Then this data is then analyzed and assessed to be linked with a certain emotional state because of research that shows dif different signals um, potentially mean different things, stress, uh, tiredness, depression. This interpretation then activates a specific desired output, uh, which in turn influences the human through that experience of the stimulus. So first in this wrist piece, I explored both haptic and auditory sensory stimulus with a wearable piece that, which sits intimately on your wrist. So this piece looks specifically at interpreting patterns of electrodome activity, which is essentially your sweat, your sweat sensors, and heart rate to recognize signs of stress and anxiety. To in turn, pneumatically actuate, so you can see the interior pockets inflating and deflating. These pockets, pockets mimic slow inhales and exhales, both auditorily and haptically, so through touch, to soothe and bring an embodied awareness of one's cognitive state and in turn influence their breathing patterns. There's a theory in psychology that you'll start to mimic uh, breathing patterns if you hear them auditorily or you feel them haptically. The second piece looks, sorry, I think I skipped a slide. Did I? No, the second piece looks at haptic guidance, however, this time not through auditory stimulus, but in the form of vibration rather than pressure. So the haptic chair piece detects again low levels or high levels of uh, EDA sweat signals um, to signal an individual's level of emotional arousal in conjunction in conjunction with motion gathered from an accelerometer. And in response, a series of 20 vibration motors lining the fins of the piece actuate when signals suggest either a state of restlessness and agitation or drowsiness and decreased focus. Third, the desk attachment looks solely at olfaction and the power of scent diffusion for focus and relaxation. So similarly to the chair, this piece looks to measure edge conditions of emo emotional arousal. Uh, in this context, which would suggest either attention or like, high levels of attention or sleepiness or an increase in stress. So devised of a multitude of layers, this piece consists of three uh, of a 3D printed rib structure, which wraps around the desk. Underneath the structure lies 100% cotton embroidered wire with 40 gauge nichrome wire embedded into it that have two discrete, you can see here on the, on the right, heating patterns. The paths directly correlate to the openings in the 3D structure above, which act as chambers to house the specific sense to be activated. So again, I mentioned earlier, either different smells might be correlated with different activities or different 
specific purposes. So depending on the physiological signal received at a certain time, a certain heating path would be deployed, resulting in either the activation of two scents. In this case, I used lavender and peppermint. And finally, the light attachment focuses its, its capability on tempering the quality of light, which the bulb emits. So again, in turn to cater the admission of brightness based on the need of the individual. So with a number of precedent work illustrates, illustrating the effect of light brightness on one's mood and alertness, this piece seeks, seeks pretty much to mimic a dimmer, but by leveraging programmable material properties and heating actuation. So due to the difference in expansion rate between the PET and aluminum material of the interior of the light bulb, when heated, a certain curling occurs, resulting in a greater permeability of light. And then it's time to test all your work. So this was during COVID, so I only had really close friends to test on, uh, including myself but essentially testing your pieces with physiological um, activity, running them through a stress test while experiencing um, the pieces that I was looking at, that I was investigating. Okay. So just to, as a mention now of what I'm working on and what the next step of that thesis draws me in. So this is my uh, dissertation title. Um, and it's quite uh, wordy as dissertation, dissertation titles like to be, uh, but essentially it's looking at how we can now interpret a lot of these concepts that I was just talking about in my thesis work into spatial systems. So essentially into architecture, into materials, into more um, spatial space uh, qualities to mitigate the severity of anxiety, specifically anxiety disorder symptoms. So stress and, and anxiety, because we know that Anxiety disorders are extremely prevalent in the United States, as I'm sure all of you are quite familiar with. And I think I just wanted to mention a big reason why this work is important, uh, or at least why I think this work is important, is that architecture as a discipline generally relies not very much on uh, data-driven research. It's often uh, what we call uh, qualitative, uh, not quantitative research. And so without both quantitative and qualitative research, very, 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 very difficult to in incorporate uh, rules and regulations into our building code, into our systems that we as architects follow and, and thus affect people in hospitals, people in prisons, people in schools. And without these building codes, schools and hospitals keep get, getting built in ways that are not necessarily appropriate for the people who inhabit them. So my work and research has a very much the end goal um, of showing very specifically through data-driven design, uh, how can we improve these spaces for better mental health and mental, mental well-being. Because um, I'm running out of time, I'm going to skip this, but my presentation will be online so that you can look more at my methods. Um, these are some of the things that I'm currently testing through the studies at Harvard. So uh, things like surface texture, visual opacity, pattern, ornaments, uh, I called intangibles, things like air quality, uh, air temperature, light, all of these things uh, subconsciously affect people in space all the time. And so these are things that I'm quantifying and actually overlaying this data with our physiological data to get a better idea of perhaps how does this impact our sleep? How does this impact um, our current our current mood and well-being? And in conclusion, my work and overall research puts forth a framework and argument towards the study of dynamically tuning our spatial qualities to address mental health. So while we continue to live among these spatial qualities every day, I believe they remain static to the malleability of human health. So by leveraging our latest technological advancements, the built environment and architecture has the immense potential to engage in the pursuit of accessible therapeutics and recognize mental health as a growing crisis, which can and should be addressed by our discipline. Um, and thank you. <laughs> All right, everyone. Um,
I'm glad uh, this introduction, the online guests will hear as well. And uh, I, if we have time at the end, I might repeat Katharina's introduction, but I think she thoroughly explained her work um, for a very exciting presentation. Next, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Joelle Kerner, who is um, currently the coordinator and instructor in the Jumpstart uh, Studio teaching together with Aura Wenkunaita. And um, I'm, I'm very excited to introduce Joelle. He's an assistant teaching professor in the School of Architecture um, at the Syracuse University, where he teaches studio pieces and representation courses. He joined the department in fall 2018. Prior to joining Syracuse University, uh, Joel was the inaugural visiting critic at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. He previously worked for architecture offices in Los Angeles and Chicago, including Morphosis Architects and Adrian Smith and Gordon Jill. Joel is a registered architect and the creative director of studio Joel Karner, a design research practice whose work research practice whose work has been the subject of solo and group exhibitions internationally, including at the Centre Pompidou in Paris, Architecture and Design Museum Los Angeles, Apartment Project in Berlin, Bureau Centre in Tallinn and the Wedge Gallery and Woodbury at U Woodbury University School of Architecture here in LA. He has recently collaborated with the Harvard University Graduate School of Design, Hart Bakker Ruins Project in Norway, and One Night Stand for Art and Architecture in Los Angeles. Since 2017, Joel has collaborated with the exhibition Archer Architecture and Archi Architecture, Architecture and Architectural and later contributed his work as part of museum's impermanent collection. He has fostered discourse by writing for Architects, Crosstalk series and contributed essays to Plot Journal, Revista Engava, Lunch Journal, New Architecture Assembly Magazine, Posit and Seesaw among others. Trell earned a Master of Architecture from Southern California Institute of Architecture and a Bachelor of Arts from Judson University. And with that, I'm welcoming Joel. Thank you. Uh, welcome to your last week. It's been really quick, but you guys have done a ton of work and I'm really excited to see where it goes. Cool. All right, so I'll start off by showing these two images. I wish I could go into more detail, but I think a lot of my work is based on looking at cities and patterns of cities. And I have a deep fascination with these things, not only as spaces that you inhabit, but I think as you'll see in my later work, understanding these as systems of organization and patterns and relationships. So what we can see in this image is a space like Marrakesh, Morocco, at least the old Medina is very informal, very bottom up, very ad hoc. And I think this typifies a lot of older cities where really architecture or the inhabited enclosed spaces were the backbone of the city. And they just kind of replicated and the city emerged out of, uh, let's say buildings and the replication of buildings. And then I think over time, we transitioned to things that look more like the image on the right, where we started to think of cities as being very top down, being very planned, being organized around efficiency and mobility and uh, repetition and legible patterns, we could say. So we can see these contrasts in a lot of cities, I think in the old world, particularly. So places like Europe or Africa or East Asia, uh, where we see, the historic centers of cities and then the contemporary kind of expanses of them. So maybe the image on the left, this is uh, the historic center of Barcelona and you can see Serdar's 1800s uh, kind of master plan for a module or unit that replicates. Uh, and then on the right, we see an old uh, kind of medieval center and then this new contemporary logistic city that has emerged around it. So I think these contrasts, um, thinking about the patterning of them, but also just uh, contrast and organization in general, I think, has really influenced me in my work. Particularly in the 20th century, I think we made huge pushes towards um, cities becoming these mass-produced machines for, for living. And of course, we have examples like Le Corbusier or Hilbersheimer that saw uh, these visions of cities that were mass-produced, that were about repetition, 
uh, that were really arranged around speed and mobility, so primary the, primarily the automobile, uh, and, and imagining um, these kind of never-ending expanses. This is in, in Jumpstart, we've talked about the idea of field condition. So I think this is uh, cities that could extend kind of potentially forever. Uh, and now today, after 100 or more years, we start to see the effects of this and, and how our cities have uh, expanded outward. And I find the Doha image on the right quite interesting in that it's uh, the first thing that goes in in the desert is this highway and this interchange, and it's the only green oasis around anywhere, yet it's not really a space for people. It's this kind of artificial green that's irrigated, and it's something that's only experienced from a car kind of zooming past it. So the infrastructure comes first, and then the buildings follow. And I think that's a very much an inversal of what cities used to be, where the buildings would come first, and then kind of infrastructure or network or connection of spaces would follow. Um, I think in this day and age, we're, we're really starting to see the effects of a lot of this very top-down planning, this kind of idea that you can master plan and solve everything. I think we have issues with uh, infrastructure, either intentionally or not, contributing to racial and socioeconomic segregation. There's issues, ecological issues, stormwater issues, temperature issues, um, connectivity issues, food accessibility issues many issues that cities are facing in the present day that uh, you may see articles like this in your newsfeed about how do we as architects start to address this and and I think as architects we can attempt to address or engage or be familiar with and uh, intend to engage with these issues but uh, I think it's it's maybe a problem to think that we can always solve it and I think that was the case with a lot of 20th century planning was we can solve it we can kind of come up with the solution um, so a lot of my research focuses at looking at spaces around the world which have kind of retroactively adapted to uh, issues of infrastructure or landscape or building. Um, and so a lot of these are retrofit and I find them very interesting in that um, unlike the 20th century planning, these are, these are spaces that are not quite infrastructure, they're not quite landscape, they're not quite building, they're kind of some amalgam of all of those. And I think this is where the future of the built environment is going, whether you are an urban designer or a landscape designer or an architect, I think there's gonna be much more uh, nuance in the projects and much less harsh kind of solid division between uh, what, is, what is the realm or purview of an architect versus an interior designer or a landscaper. Um, I wish I could go into detail about these projects. They're quite amazing. Um, here are some I find interesting. This is a, a roundabout that has a maritime museum underneath it. So the structure of the roundabout itself, it needs to be elevated um, to prevent flooding, but it also needs a certain height to uh, cross the river. And then you utilize the space underneath to use your programming for your museum. So this is a case where your roundabout is your maritime museum. Or cases like this where instead of a water treatment facility and your neighborhood recreation park, you have your water treatment facility as your recreation park, or your railroad bridge as your office, or your landfill as your neighborhood park, which a lot of cities are doing. Uh, I think outside of uh, Missouri, I want to say they have uh, one called Mount Trashmore, which I want to know more about. I think there's actually one in Florida too, another Mount Trashmore. Um, or a scenario like this, where the roof of your shopping mall is your neighborhood sport pitch. And so I think these are scenarios. I mean, some of these are, of course, out of necessity of lack of space, but I think a lot of these are just designers in the present day being a little bit more uh, creative and tactful about how we utilize space in the city and we be more efficient, whether that's economically uh, in, in relation to climate, in relation to uh, walkability, many different factors. Um, this one here, this one is quite interesting. There's a bridge, but in all of the little gaps of the structure of the bridge, there's um, convenience stores, there's auto mechanic shops, there's lawyers offices, there's even a nightclub here, which I find super fascinating that you go to the nightclub under the bridge. Um, or this one in Turkey where the interchange is the botanic garden. So if you have to have the botanic garden, which I think is a nice thing for a city and you have to have the interchange to move people around the city, I think this is a good example of kind of leveraging or, or overlapping those scenarios and getting a, um, a more efficient space in the city. Um, or scenarios like this where there's many, many, many of these little noodles in and around uh, Tokyo and Kobe in this case where existing streets were then retroactively added a, a structure or canopy on top of that. 
uh, which produces these kind of arcade conditions. They're kind of plaza, they're kind of arcade. If you were to draw this in a figure ground, should it be black because it's kind of building or should it be white because it's kind of your plaza or street? I think these scenarios become ambiguous in a productive way. And what I find interesting is if you drop the street view, people are still cycling through here. So the idea that your morning commute is uh, not purely relegated to the street proper, but it's kind of in this uh, gray or tertiary space between um, building and infrastructure. So I think a lot of looking at those scenarios has influenced my own work, but also uh, what I bring to my studios when I teach. So I often use this formula, blank is blank, just as a quick way to start to generate ideas for, for myself or for my students. Um, so I think a lot of the examples I showed were perhaps building as landscape or infrastructure as building big box as sport court. So a big box would be something like a Home Depot, Walmart, um, Target, those big stores. And can you start to utilize that for let's say recreation field? Um, I think even components of buildings. So thinking of your entire wall as acting or behaving or serving the function of a door um, down to relationships. Like, do we make the small things very large? Do we make the large things very small? And I think these uh, produce a lens through which you can start to uh, produce new iterations, new options and new ideas for your designs. Uh, or particularly um, inside as outside or public as private, which I think is pretty relevant to what we're doing in Jumpstart with our um, AUD houses in Los Angeles. Um, so to show some of my work, uh, again, I'm really fascinated by these old, older cities that have um, certain patterning to them. And what I find interesting again is that the buildings are almost self-similar. They're kind of permutations of each other. There's kind of a, um, I, I don't know if I want to say style, but uh, there's this beauty in the way that it starts to replicate uh, and array and grow over time that we don't have in contemporary cities that are planned around infrastructure and lots. So to contrast that, taking influence from that, I started to look at what would a version of that look like in a city like Los Angeles, which is known as being very, uh, autocentric or sprawl or everything on a grid. So some of you may recognize this is the 405 going down and the 10 going across. This is just, just down the street from us. Um, you can kind of see Westwood and Pico up there. Uh, but this is an exercise at looking at um, the buildings as a kind of system. And I think specifically in this project, there was uh, a goal to have buildings behave kind of like infill lots, but also kind of as a network and kind of in between. And there's this no one size fits all in terms of how the architecture is behaving in this. But collectively, if you look at it as a whole, it produces a kind of texture or pattern or composition that is similar to these older cities I was influenced by. Um, I continued to test that in, uh, this is a proposal for the waterfront of Oslo, which this is 10 years old as a project. So since then, a lot of this development actually has happened. And I think in a way, this was a, a, almost a reaction towards or against the development that they were undertaking in Oslo at the time. Um, but again, I was drawing influence from older things. So this is a 1700s drawing of Rome. And what I like about it is that there's no clear boundary between one building and another building or what is inside and what is outside, or what came first and what came after, right? It's just kind of this homogenous texture of, or let's say heterogeneous texture rather, of buildings. On the right, uh, Jumpstart students, we visited uh, Tom Main's offshoot office, Stray Dog Cafe. So those Morphosis projects, those are the plans that I took for the image on the right, where I put them together and basically was trying to come up with what would it look like if a contemporary architect uh, created a city like this, where there was no seam or separation between one project and the next. So something like this would require a lot of uh, successive authorship. Uh, and then also specifically in Norway, looking at the uh, Snohetta's Oslo Opera House here, which is a public plaza on the roof. This specific photograph is taken from the Red Bull, uh, like Flutog day. So this, the roof of the building becomes this very public accessible uh, amenity for the public realm of the city. Yet underneath it is all of this building, which is actually performing art spaces. So if you were to draw that in a figure ground drawing, it should be black because it's a building, it's program, but it should also be white because it's plaza. So it kind of uh, can't be truly represented with figure ground. And I think that was the, the real impetus for this work here, where 
um, it was really trying to project across this waterfront. Actually, the big thing in the center there, that's the plan of the opera house. So this is all, all of my stuff is kind of around it. Um, but I think looking at those urban projects, I am an architect and so I would, I am interested in buildings and trying to realize these things. So I, I kind of strayed away from the, to look at just individual projects. So this was a competition for a museum in Helsinki. And uh, there were 1500 submitting at them. A lot of the, this was our site area that we were given. A lot of the projects did the standard, uh, put your shiny object in the middle of your lot. And then the rest of the lot is amorphous space that is unorganized. So really with this one, we were trying to push the program as far towards the city center as we could, towards the transit stop, trying to have more of a connection with the corner here and um, connecting some of the existing uh, pedestrian ways and bike paths onto this. And I think the major thesis for this project was these leftover spaces, which we're hatching here as solid black, which uh, the idea is that this could be an, a future extension of the ferry terminal programming this way. It could be an extension of the park and forest coming this way. These could be future lots for future things like libraries or uh, cinemas or whatever it needs to fill in. And so I think this is a project where I'm trying to be an architect designing buildings, but in a way that um, they could have broader urban ambition, let's say. Um, this one was for a competition for the Central Square in Tallinn, Estonia. This is the old, whoops, it's the old medieval historic center. And this is the right at the nexus between the old medieval center and the new, let's say, contemporary city. And they were looking at how do we redefine this square and bring character to it. So I think the major thesis of this project was um, that we're having the transit and this is, uh, there's three tram lines that run here, go underneath the project and then uh, capping over this with the public square. And then most importantly, using the architecture itself as a kind of framing device to frame and establish the square that doesn't really exist because in the historic center, those historic buildings frame it. So I think this is thinking about a kind of solid void operation and also how a building can be a kind of framing device. I think um, this is a transition into going smaller and smaller scale, but still thinking about these relationships of, let's say designing through figure ground or solid void or, um, or patterning or texture. Um, so this was for an installation that asked artists to look at the site of a motel room as an exhibition. So this is looking at the furniture in figure ground and playing with that as a certain pattern. Um, so maybe this is a good comparison here of the way I was thinking about this, where the image on the left is an archive or catalog of the existing furniture, which you could think of that as an analogy for a contemporary city like Los Angeles, where uh, everything is on a grid, they're spaced apart with infrastructure, there's a repetition, let's say in LA, of a uh, strip mall, house, office building, right? There's these kind of patterns that repeat. And then on the right, that's what I was more interested in, is those same parts and pieces, but reconfigured in a way that is a bit more unpredictable or um, uh, ad hoc, let's say. So through some drawing exercises, I ended up with, I think, 10 of these pieces total that were fabricated and put into the room as an installation. So for our Jumpstart students, I think this is a good reference of taking something existing, in this case, furniture, defamiliarizing that in some way through process or manipulation or abstraction, and then uh, creating something new out of it. And in this case, these pieces, I think still are spatial and are still formal and still have a lot of qualities of a building or a city. Um, and then this is me re, re-familiarizing them in a way through the addition of scale. So could this behave at the scale of a table? Could it behave at the scale of a, a room or a building or a collection of buildings? And I think that's really how uh, I work is through, through drawing and abstracting it and then recontextualizing it through some lens, whether that's economic or programmatic or, um, or in that case, scale. Uh, this was for an exhibition design where I took some of those same ideas, um, but really thought about the floor of the gallery as a drawing that people would come into and inhabit. So instead of just putting the work on the wall, like you would see in a typical gallery, I wanted the, the floor to become its own project and become its own uh, drawing. So these pieces, they became 
pedestals. They became kind of canvases, kind of pedestals uh, that hosted uh, 10 projects in total. So this was a uh, exhibition that was showing previous work and previous projects. Um, but I think a lot of those drawings and a lot of uh, working through those systems, I continued to test that. In fact, literally the same pieces of information in uh, could this become the pattern of a facade? So in this case, we're contrasting um, uh, different levels of transparency or different levels of translucency. So like matte versus shiny. Um, and, uh, but I find this most interesting that this kind of work comes out of drawings first. And, and I, I think a lot of times we think of architecture as uh, think up the idea first and then draw it. And I think in this case, I'm drawing it first because I don't know what I'm making. And then I think up the idea of what that thing could become. Uh, so does anybody have an idea of what this drawing is of? No guess, right? It's weird. So this um, this was a series of drawings that was specifically trying to be ambiguous or confusing with what it was representing because there's information in here that would suggest to you it's very, very small, like at the scale of a door section. But there's also information in here that would lead you to believe it's very, very large at the scale of a building or uh, someone even thought these were drawings of a parking lot. Um, so I like these, these drawings, and as you can see from some of the earlier work, I'm playing a lot with inverting uh, the figure in the ground and uh, playing a lot with ambiguity and scale. So uh, I think these four drawings here show a lot of the process, and I think is a good example of iterating on taking the same bones of something, but really uh, changing some parameters and changing some uh, some things and seeing what you get out of it. So I think these drawings, they, they're not representative of anything. They're just uh, generative drawings, but I think you can see the relationship to uh, the urban influences and inspiration that I'm taking from. Uh, so maybe for the sake of time, I won't go through these, but these are current drawings I'm working on that are more uh, territorial. They're more landscape and they're more broad. But again, I think they have the same idea of very, very kind of small elements or things that could seem small um, in, a, in a backdrop that's very, very large. So I think they're still playing with um, scale and ambiguity. Um, and then maybe just to end on some of my teaching, this is the first studio I ever taught. Uh, and it was looking at Osaka as a concept text in these really odd scenarios of a performing arts center that's built around an interchange or um, parking and, and I think a prison actually that's built around an interchange, uh, municipal buildings, recreation spaces. Uh, and we looked at this site, this little interchange as a, as a gap in the city and asked students to develop an arrangement of program based on the local context. So we ended up with some raccoon cafes laundromats, things that might seem like very mundane program, but were very much tied to the area and very much tied to what we were producing. And then this project here, this studio, I think influenced me a lot in further studios that I started to teach. So this was a visiting studio in Charlotte, which asked the studio to take on some issue that Charlotte was facing as a city. And this is an image of a local office that's working on this plan to cap landscape over the highways. And so we took that on as a project and said, landscape is not enough because we can point to other cities, other examples like Boston's Big Dig um, and have a critique of that. So we decided that um, we need building and we need landscape and we need this to act in an infrastructural way. So the director of the program uh, wanted uh, students to do an urban design and the director of the graduate program wanted students to do a building. So we compromised and said, uh, let's try to do both. So there's 15 students and each of their projects is existing here in the same space at the same time. And it's asking students to be really responsive to each other. And this was a summer studio, it was six weeks. So not that much longer than we're doing here. Uh, but I really loved it because this was the process through the whole studio was just uh, laying these things out together and the students had agency over their own project and their own thing, but also this responsiveness and successive authorship with what their neighbors or classmates were producing. Um, yeah, I wish I could go into more about what those are, but same sort of idea of uh, each project is doing something different for the collective class whole. Um, so I started to 
build on a series of studios at Syracuse, my home institution, taking those issues on. This one was a bunch of vacant land in Chicago that's been open for 15 years after they demolished a kind of failed uh, housing project. And we coupled that with the forest preserves of Cook County that is needing uh, 90,000 acres of uh, new habitat or new restored land. And so this is a map showing their current land that they own. And then the red dot is our site in Chicago. So we thought, could this be a new opportunity to rebuild a new kind of neighborhood in the center, but also uh, do it in a way that is, um, could be used for ecological habitat for the city. So same idea where we're working through as a class, collective drawings and collective discussions about our areas of intervention. And then each student taking their agency in terms of what they're bringing to the project in terms of food production or um, housing or offices or um, recreation. Some of them were replacing existing dilapidated structures like a local school and just readapting their, their needs to the site. Um, and then these drawings I found really interesting coming out of it, which were, um, this is the collective result out of what we got in the class. So these are the footprints of where the buildings touch the ground. And then these are the forested and, and uh, wetland or savanna spaces that were left over from it. Um, we did one in Mexico City that was the site of a failed 1960s utopia project. So we took that on. What if we tried to do that in the contemporary day? Um, so we ended up with, this one was nice because every student had a rim condition on the volcano and then a valley condition, and they had to negotiate this extreme drop in, uh, in uh, height. So we had religious spaces, we had schools, uh, we had an ecotourism, and every student had to bring some kind of what we were calling resource loop which was water or food or power or uh, waste, those kinds of things that they were incorporating into how they were imagining their, their piece contributing to a larger whole in, in an effort to, let's say, um, do something other than master planning at all. Uh, and there they are negotiated. And I'll just end with this project. This is uh, my one from last fall, which was looking at uh, Bogota, Colombia. All of the little black pieces are spaces where there's huge, breaches in the city and you need a pedestrian bridge to cross over. So the city starts to look like a series of staples, stapled all over with these pedestrian bridges. And we started to look at this little zone, which was the nexus of a river and a highway. That's the existing condition. And here are all the little pedestrian bridges. And this is actually a divide between two different socioeconomic strata. So we started to look at that and say, can we just extend the program that's there on the sides? And I think maybe the thesis for this one is uh, bridge as building, like ped bridge as building. So we started to thicken those things up. Uh, and again, this is a collaborative process. And I think some of the most interesting work from the studio where these were drawings made by everyone in the class. Someone drew something, someone else added something else. Um, we talked about ones we liked, we shared them, we shared the files, and everyone just kind of had a free-for-all to adding or subtracting or producing new variation. And I think through that process is how we ended up with a lot of what ended up being the buildings. So here they are. Uh, this is what a lot of our studio sessions look like, trying to navigate um, the seams and edges. And I had this idea, you have that idea, how can they play together? Sometimes you want to contrast them, other times you want them to be very complementary. Um, and then each student, of course, taking authorship over their thing as a building and thinking about the uh, tectonics of this. Um, I will say most of this work is third year studio work, just for reference. These are third year undergraduate students. Um, that's it, I'll end there. Thank you guys. All right, I think we have time for a few questions and I'm gonna ask Jess to help with the microphone to go around. And then maybe Katarina and Joel, you wanna be up here to answer any questions? All right. Wait, no one is gonna see your faces. But depending on who has your question. Most beautiful city. Can you please do it from there? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Most beautiful city. Uh, maybe Bergen, Norway. I haven't been to a lot of cities, but of the ones I've been to, Bergen, Norway is really gorgeous. Mexico City, too. Organized Mexico City. Um, 
organized city, uh, La Plata, the one I showed in Argentina. I've never been there, but maybe uh, Ariel has. Yeah. yeah, he's cringing. <laughs> More questions? You're too shy. Um, the hardest research? I would just say generally when you deal with humans more uh, on the ground every day, and that applies for uh, more wearable design, but also architecture, if you do testing with humans every day, that's really difficult research because um, you're dealing with people and every single person is extremely different. So um, it's kind of easy when you just consider people as one global entity, but when you're actually having to test people one by one, it takes a lot of time and it's very difficult. Right. Uh, none so far, but anyone online, please feel free to post them in the Q and A section. Thank you. Okay. How about if anyone ask a question? So, Katerina, for you, I very much enjoyed seeing that you summit uh, of your academic research at Harvard and the kind of correct me if I'm wrong, but the kind of fixture on the chair, the fixture on the table, and the fixture on the arm, right? Those are also part of that research, right? The, the master's research, yeah. The master's research, not the um, dissertation. No, the, it was the research that essentially inspired the dissertation. But I'm thinking, like, also for the students to kind of uh, further ponder on what the meaning of something on a small scale item, like an accessory or furniture piece, might mean uh, in terms of the relevancy to architectural space. Mm -hmm. um, I'm asking that question because I get that question quite a bit. And I think that the moment you start testing your ideas of a smaller scale product, you very quickly get a feedback group what works and what doesn't. Yeah. While in architecture, as we did in several other lectures, things take really long time to investigate. Mm -hmm. And so for a mystery, many architects have always, for example, looked at a chair to understand its proportions, relationship to materials, tectonics, and then apply that understanding onto the larger scale. So do you have already ideas for your dissertation on how these kinds of smaller scale objects would potentially be applied on a larger scale? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, like you said, yeah, it's really um, uh, testing things out quickly to kind of figure out what works and what doesn't work in a really rapid manner uh, and a more rigorous manner that can be controlled and scientifically assessed. But um, I think right now in the studies that I'm conducting on the, the spatial scale, the architecture scale, it's a lot of interior design work um, and using materials that I would call are programmable or changing materials that are more active rather than static. So changing the texture, changing the openings of also how much light come in, comes in depending on uh, the porosity of the material. Um, and uh, right now, we also have a whole study going on around just materials themselves. So um, what types of materials in space create different effects? So perhaps a completely naturally cladded room, so with wood and perhaps stone versus um, uh, metal and concrete. You know, what types of materials do you choose and how does that impact actually the mental health of people inside? So. Uh, on the spatial level, it's a lot of it's trying to scale uh, these quick little um, prototypes, either material-wise or geometrically or scale. Yes. Ah, 
coming over there. Oh, the chair, the one. Yeah, the, the line between comfort and discomfort. Um, well, because funny enough, some people love that chair, felt like it was a massage, and then other people got really just uh, creeped out by it. Um, so I my thesis for my undergrad was looking at how by making people slightly just uncomfortable and uh, they become more vulnerable. And when um, they're more vulnerable, there's more potential for change, psychological change. So um, the whole the whole theory was around vulnerability as something that is actually more easily accessed through um, discomfort and then um, being able to perhaps subconsciously manipulate the, the mental perception of things. Did you would you say that's like the most potential moving forward? Because I've heard a lot about like LA and Amsterdam, but I'm not entirely sure. Like, are there like a bunch of others that are like pretty promising? Yeah, I think I think LA is a good one. I think Houston is a good one. I think uh, like Phoenix, I think a ton of basically really bad US cities are great candidates for moving forward. Um, I moved here in, in I don't know, 2009, 2010, and uh, no, I don't, there was a ton of infrastructure that didn't exist. For example, the, I can't pull it up, but the, the LA one I did, I actually lived in that drawing at the time that I was making it. And there's a, a rail line called the Expo line that was under construction. And I was working at Morphosis at the time I did that project. Um, and I worked actually at the beach too. And so in theory, I could, oh, and I was going to Sciarc. So I could have gone from Sciarc to my house, to the beach, to Morphosis, all on that same rail line. And it didn't exist yet. So if, it was one of those things where it was right place, wrong time. Uh, but I've been away from LA 10 years. I left in 2013 and coming back, I can already see so many things changing. Um, and even where I'm staying right now, so many things that were just green lawn are now kind of landscaped or what's called zero scaping, uh, where it's landscaping it in a way that takes less water and, and is more kind of local to the climate and habitat. Um, and I think he, uh, I spent eight years in Chicago um, Chicago has a lot of, same with New York City, they're dense cities, so they already had a lot of pedestrian infrastructure and like biking infrastructure and a lot of typical things. Um, so I think in a lot of ways, um, those cities were, have been prototypes for a lot of other cities to adapt to. Uh, but I think places like Amsterdam and a lot of, let's say, old world cities, particularly in Europe, uh, were kind of because of the way they were, they had an old footprint and old infrastructure that they were retroactively adapted very quickly. And uh, a place like Amsterdam becomes a prototype for New York City. And then New York City becomes a prototype for Chicago. And then Chicago becomes a prototype for LA. And it kind of trickles down into uh, the kind of uh, worse and worse planned cities, particularly, let's say, uh, in the American Southwest. What we get wrong is something very small, um, but there's also this concept of like a sign, where you like um, sidewalk has like a baby, for example. Um, and so my question is, how do you imagine promoting this concept that there's one thing in the structure to act as another thing um, to like other places in the world where spaces are more limited and like that this idea is very useful. Yeah, actually there's a really great book. Um I mean, it's an exhibition catalog, not really a book, but it's called Architecture Without Architects by Bernard Rudofsky, specifically looking at spaces, old world cities, very old kind of small villages and things. And it was an exhibition at MoMA. And it was basically like, this is what a city could be without architects because it's just like the local people, local, local craftsmen. I think the case is we have a very, not a very long legacy, but several hundred year legacy, especially coming out of Europe. And then uh, by extension in the American region, all of the Americas I mean in that, um, of kind of planned cities and, and top-down planning. And what's happening is a lot of, 
places like Vietnam or villages in Africa or um, smaller kind of ad hoc cities are now being, uh, lessons are being drawn from them and we're actually loosening up our zoning regulations. So I think a lot of the case in Europe and I think the Americas has been over regulation of you can only build this much on this lot this size set back this much with this all of these restrictions and we're starting to loosen those up and and what can and cannot be built and the more we loosen that up you have to take health safety and welfare into account and obviously there's things logistical things like sewage and water and power and things that you have to take into account but we're seeing a lot more loosening up of zoning and regulations and things getting built that would not have been permitted to be built in the recent past so for Jumpstart students, I think that's a good uh, case with the ADUs that we're designing, the accessory dwelling units, which uh, in a lot of cases would not have been permitted in the past. Uh, but we, we had coach houses and things, um, Laura gave a great lecture on that, where uh, we can look to older cities like Chicago that had a little horse coach kind of horse garage in the back that was converted to ADUs. And now we're using those as prototypes to build in LA and Houston and other places. So I think maybe to answer it, it's to loosen up regulation and that's the way forward. Yeah, the sleep mask, um, the material we use is called hydrogel. Uh, there, um, it's this type of material that absorbs liquid and expands a lot. And then the liquid over time um, evaporates and then you can kind of replenish it and do it over and over again. So um, we worked with the science department at Harvard to essentially make our own hydrogel and infuse scents into it. And then the only way the scent would get deployed is through heat. So the heat that the embed, embedded heater that we had inside of the sleep mask, um, the activation occurred because of, um, I mean, using eye patterns um, and especially yeah, muscle tension on the face would have been great, but a little bit of an easier way to do it is looking at sleep patterns through different physiological metrics. So just like a lot of you wear Apple watches and Fitbits that regulate your sleep, uh, even tapping into that information can be really helpful. So uh, it was communicated via Bluetooth to a, like a Fitbit that was saying, okay, you've entered like REM, this REM cycle of sleep. And so, um, and then it would, the scent would be deployed. So that's how, that's how we... Just out of curiosity, so have you guys ever tried to any of these on fail? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, a lot of uh, the whole in, in academia, a lot of the purpose is also about putting papers out there so that the ideas get out and get distributed. And most of the projects have papers associated to them that um, have a step by step process of how to build it, how to, um, as a way not only to, you know, share knowledge, but also to say, hey, we thought about this. Um, and yeah, we have been contacted for a multitude of different projects and I've been contacted for stuff. The issue is um, taking any of those to market um, requires huge amounts of testing to make sure everything is you know, safe and uh, also works and has no faulty issues. So I think it's one of those things that I might pursue after my PhD. But I was wondering how do you generate form? Because you have really beautiful kind of uh, wearables, right? So I know you always work, for example, uh, like a lot of inspiration comes from nature, right? Is there a particular product that yeah, there was a huge debate about that in my last. Uh, uh, I keep I I don't necessarily touch on aesthetics when I present my work, um, but one of my advisors, Antoine Picon, is like, but there's aesthetic. What where does it come from? Um, yeah, I do draw upon a lot of organic shapes, uh, like shells and more skeletal shapes. Like a lot of my things are very um, kind of. I feel like they're cages that encapsulate different meanings or um, uh, 
different purposes. So, um, but in some cases, and I think as all of your, all the students have started to realize, sometimes aesthetic over the years becomes intuitive. And I just think from a very early time in undergrad, I started developing a style and then that style embedded itself unconsciously in all of the work I do. But, but from my beginning, the first, my first three years of architecture schools, almost all my projects were derived from different uh, seashells, different uh, skeletons of dried insects, like different natural things, and somehow it ended up uh, transforming. Okay, uh, we're good with questions or one more? I get the question. So, yeah, because there has been a lot of regulation for that, and and um, you know, there's something called NIMBY, not in my backyard. It's like I, I bought this house. I, I want my nice privacy and have my barbecue, but I don't want a high rise to go next to me. There are real concerns with that. So I think that's why I like loosening up regulations. But I think there's always going to be some amount, like I say, in terms of health, safety, and welfare, and um, certain economic concerns. But I think there's been a ton of stuff that's come in in recent years that is actually quite promising in terms of, it wasn't that long ago that, you know, suburban development or sprawl, and there's a lot of people that address that, like the Congress of New Urbanism, and lots of people address the issues of suburbia and sprawl. Um, but in recent years, we've seen things like a Walmart that you would think is like, oh, that could never be done in a good way, actually done in an interesting way. And when I was an undergrad, I remember asking my professors, why can't we have a Target in, in or Walmart or Big Box, whatever it is, in downtown Chicago. And they said, oh, that's ridiculous. Could never happen for this, this, and this reason. And then it, I probably by the time I was in grad school, there was a Target in downtown uh, Chicago in a historic uh, Louis Sullivan building. It's amazing. So, I mean, if there's a will, there's a way. And, and I think a lot of things revolve around supply and demand. And if there's a demand for it, there will be a supply. And I think attitudes are changing, even just culturally beyond design, but let's say, you know, more healthful lifestyles or more um, you know, economically conscious or sourced, uh, um, you know, um, what am I trying to say? Um, ethically sourced things. Uh, I think that goes a long way in terms of when people's attitudes or, or perceptions of what they value change, I think design catches up to it. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. With that, uh, we conclude our lecture, summer lecture series. And thank you all for joining in.